السلام عليكم بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. So today we're going to talk about the Ottomans, the Uthmanian, the Safavids or Safawiya, and the Mughals. And this is the 11th lecture in the series. I hope you're all preparing for the final quiz as well as preparing your final research papers. Ahlan wa sahlan, assalamu alaikum ya tullab al So, we are gonna talk about the Sahavids, Ottomans, Mughals, who are all what? Directly related to the Ottoman Empire in some way, shape, or form. And in the case with the Mughals, they're direct descendant, direct lineage of Genghis Khan. So you have Babur, the conqueror that we talked about before, the founder, if you will, of the Mughal Empire. And you have Hamayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb. All of them are direct descendants of Genghis Khan. And Timurlang, uh, Timur meaning, or Timur meaning iron, Lang meaning uh, limp or lame, as we say in English, lame, lang. Uh, you gotta remember these are Indo European languages we're dealing with, Persian and Urdu. So Lang is the equivalent to lame, L A M E, because he walked with a limp, because he was hit by an iron. Uh, arrowhead into the knee and we had talked about Tamale already but I thought this was another cool picture and kind of just another way to show how he fits into all this himself being a descendant of Genghis Khan and Babur also being a descendant of Timur So we already talked a little bit about the Timurids, the you know Mughals and all that, but I just kind of want to briefly talk about uh, Islam in South Asia. Typically, before the Mughal period, um, the history is kind of glossed over, so I just want to make sure that it was included. So um, during the Khulafa Rashidun, Muslim armies reached Sindh. And that began the Islamic presence in South Asia. And the Ghurid dynasty of Tajik Afghan Buddhist origin, they were brand new converts when they started to conquer South Asia. They referred to themselves as the Shansabani. And uh, recent Muslim converts, as I said, they invaded India and their reign lasted a short time from 1175 to 1217 and the Delhi Sultanate began encroaching on them as early as 1206 and they reigned until 1526 and then the Mughal Empire said uh, to have been founded by Babur started to conquer the Delhi Sultanate and um, he was also aided by the Safavids and Ottomans in uh, conquering the Delhi Sultanate. Um, the Safavids and the Ottomans kind of looked uh, to Babur as an equal because of the Mongolian connection, ostensibly. Um, and we can see in this picture here, this map, that the uh, Ghurid Empire already um, basically had reached the Bengal, you know, conquered northern India, what we would call, you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan for the most part. And it's it's a quite, uh, quite a swath of territory that's already been conquered as early as 1175. Now, Babur, we already talked about last week, so I'm not going to get 
uh, into his story all that much, but he's kind of known as the first Mughal. He reigned from 1495 to 1530. And Shah Ismail of the Safavids, he was the first Safavid ruler. He helped Babur invade India, but he wanted Babur to convert to Shi'i Islam, Twelver Imami Shi'ism. And wear, you know, the red Safavid headgear, Taji Haidari, um, which was a Shiite symbol, but uh, Babur didn't end up doing that, he didn't convert, he didn't wear that headdress. And um, it kind of set the tone for these tense relations that the Safavids and Mughals would, would continue to have until, you know, the end of the Safavids, essentially. The Mughals would outlast them. And the Mughals, like, he, these are not all of the rulers, but just some of the notable ones. Um, so Babur, he wrote an autobiography, and he's the one pictured uh, above me here. But he wrote an autobiography in uh, Chagatai Turkish. And he also did write in Persian, knew about Persian. He was known to be fond of alcohol and He was known to be a patron of the arts and a scholar of the humanities himself, such as, you know, poetry, prose, music, and, um, you know, just spoke the Turkic uh, language very, very well. And I'm sure he was quite competent in Persian, but more comfortable in Turkish. Humayun um, was more comfortable with Persian and um, he lost some territory and had, had to ask the Safavids for some help and um, they helped him essentially regain his throne so there's this kind of this tense relationship with the Safavids but at the end of the day the Safavids would rather have an ally in India than a hostile force like the Rajputs. And Jalaluddin Akbar, who we will talk about more extensively here, um, he took over and he's known as one of the greatest Mughal rulers um, and a lover of poetry or poetic performances at his court, a lover of Qawali, or mystical kind of Sufi uh, music or poetry and then you have Jahangir Shah Jahan who's famously built the Taj Mahal and Aurangzeb also known as Alamgir who is the son of Shah Jahan and um, he undid a lot of what his predecessor set up but especially that of Jalaluddin Akbar And Aurangzeb, he's kind of seen as an Islamicizer of the Mughal Empire, or a reformer, if you will. Was very concerned with the religious aspects of the empire. Now, Jalaluddin Akbar, he's also known in Persian as Akbari Azmi, and or, or, or Akbar the Great, or the Greatest. Uh, he was the third Mughal emperor, and he reigned from 1556 to 1605. And Akbar succeeded his father, Humayun. Um, he was quite young when he uh, succeeded his father, um, not even yet a teenager. And so there was uh, sort of like, uh, he was basically kind of um, counseled r rather constantly by advisors. Who kind of made the real um, decisions in the court while he was young kind of like the viziers if you will um, but I believe when he was in his early 20s he basically took over completely as Emperor and dismissed some of those advisors and he was known for when he would conquer a certain uh, principality or kingdom that he would not just behead or kill the 
um, king of that kingdom, but rather he would show mercy, which was different from his predecessors, allow them to live and essentially made them as suzerainties. They had to pay taxes to the Mughal Empire and jizya tax, um, their Hindu or you know the zakat if they were Muslim, as well as additional taxes. And he also married a Hindu wife, which was quite controversial during his time. Um, it was debated whether Hindus were Ahl al-Kitab or Mushrikeen polytheists, because if they're Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, like Jews and Christians, then you would be allowed to marry them. And they do have, you know, their own religious texts written in Sanskrit. Um, so in that sense, they do have a kitab. They do have a scripture. Um, and some of them do claim to be monotheists. So it, it's it, the ulama were kind of um, on the fence or at, in disagreement as to whether or not um, certain Hindus were... Uh, Ahl al-Kitab or Mushrikeen. And one thing you also have to remember is that even the category of Hindu is a modern construct, um, a colonial construct by the colonial British. Before the modern period, there was no um, self-defined religion as Hindu that Hindus identified as no they saw different Hindu groups as being different religious groups and they fought one another they didn't see themselves as one identity in fact the term Hindustan was a Mughal term not a term that the Indians used for themselves this was something that the Mughals actually invented so that whole identity is a modern construct that did not previously exist and so each kingdom principality might have had its own religion or multiple religions there and the ulama like i said they were undecided as to which one is going to be considered ahl al-kitab or mushrikeen they, so it was a complicated thing it was controversial for him to marry a hindu wife when such matters were not settled, so to say. But he set that precedent, and it was a tradition that many Mughal emperors uh, carried on after that. And even though he technically didn't have political control over all of the Asian subcontinent, um, his influence did extend throughout the Asian subcontinent because of the Mughal military, political, cultural, and economic dominance. And so he wanted to, you know, Jalal Din Akbar wanted to centralize administration, um, kind of have a little bit more of an authoritarian grasp on affairs. And like I said, whenever he would conquer someone, he would want to use diplomacy and marriage as a way to expand the empire rather than just fighting and killing. So in one sense, he was kind of a pacifist, but you could see him, you know, riding an elephant, which was is kind of a chauvinist thing there. You know, it, it reminds you of Putin riding his horse, that famous picture of Putin shirtless riding a horse. Here you have Jalaluddin Akbar riding an elephant. Elephants were used for battle, right? And you could see these depictions of uh, Jalaluddin's court. You know, there is, it looks like a, a leopard in his court. Um, you know, people with all kinds of weapons, muskets and swords. You know, this was the gunpowder age and all kinds of different people there and of course there's a very famous film that's made about his life called Joda Akbar Joda being his Hindu wife and their marriage and the controversy that it ensued and it's also like a little bit of a romance story and it's you know I would consider it a historical fiction however what is historically accurate is the cultural ethos that is portrayed that is truly what 
Mughal culture looked like and truly what medieval India looked like at that time. So there's a lot of things that is, is quite accurate. However, um, it would have been much nicer if the movie just wasn't completely in Hindi because um, they would have been speaking Persian or like a Turkic language and not just Urdu or Hindi the entire film. So that part was a little bit cheesy. Um, but overall, it's a good film at kind of capturing the, the ethos of the time, if you will. So I do recommend that people watch it in order to understand this time period, because for the most part, you're going to get, um, you know, uh, a big bird's eye holistic view of the culture and the time. But the details might differ, right? And he wanted to have an empire that was very religiously tolerant and culturally diverse. And so he would do things to allow pilgrimages for different religions, you know, these different kind of Hindu religions, um, treat uh, Jains and Buddhists um, well and those types of things, um, and not try to oppress anybody. He was trying to make a cosmopolitan empire, if you will. Um, much like the Mongols before them and uh, much like the Persian Empire before them, uh, ancient Persians. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a normal way of uh, trying to have a empire that covers large swathes, you know, of land is by being cosmopolitan. And he wasn't concerned with tribalism or um, he wasn't overly zealous about his Islamic identity. Um, he just wanted to unite his empire um, through loyalty in Indo, you know, as expressed in Indo-Persian culture, right? Um, and he was quite a good statesman, quite a good politician, well learned in the religion, despite what people might say. Um, and he kind of represented a more open-minded, tolerant, and liberal type of Islam, if you will, um, that differs from one of his successors, Aurangzeb. And so Aurangzeb, which literally means ornament of the throne, or Alamgir, conqueror of the world, Alam from Arabic meaning world, Alamgir, and he reigned from 1658 to 1707. And he's famous for Islamicizing the Mughal Empire or reforming it Islamically and changing the policies of his predecessors. And that's a European uh, drawing there on the top. And underneath is a Islamic uh, drawing of Alamgir you know, praying, and you can see the prayer beads there. It's trying to show that he was a devout Muslim. And he's famous for commissioning the Hanafi Fatawa collection, known as Al Fatawa Al Hindiya, to the Arabs. And you can see it, it's a watermark in the background of the slide. So you can see it says Fatawa Al Hindiya, and underneath that it says, Fatawa al Alamgiriya. So that's the name of the book, and it was the product of a large group of ulama who all came together to write this multi volume Hanafi fiqh text. And it says Fatawa, but it's really like a large uh, metan or a large uh, if you will. It just tells you kind of the basic rules of what to do. It's not in a question and answer format. Um, I have worked, you know, I've published stuff with and worked on this book before. Um, and it was meant to be uh, the imperial legal code for the Mughals, which, uh, you know, was to be like an equivalent 
or in the spirit of the Mongolian Yasa. You got to remember these people are descendants of Genghis Khan and what they considered an empire, what they considered as a proper administration or law was really based off the Mongol Mongolian idea of empire, just with Islam superimposed over it. So when he commissioned this kind of uh, book as imperial law, it, it also, you know, has this kind of concept of a, a universal imperial law behind it, like the Ottoman or like the the Mongolian Yasa, and the bureaucracy that went along with that, and the style of uh, practicing it, right? And um, Despite kind of his Islamicizing uh, mentality, um, his imperial bureaucracy employed more Hindus than any other Mughal emperor before him between 1679 and 1707. The number of Hindu officials in the Mughal administration rose by half. Excuse me. To represent 31.6% of Mughal nobility, and that was the highest it ever reached in the Mughal area, and many of them are Marathas and Rajputs, who were the political allies of the Mughals. Um, Joda, who was, you know, Jalaluddin Akbar's wife, I believe was a Rajput from the Rajputs, and um, Aurangzeb encouraged high-ranking Hindu officials to convert to Islam, um, but that doesn't mean they did. In fact, the highest rates of conversion uh, during this period were happening in the Punjab and the Bengal, and they were people who were not uh, fully integrated into uh, Hindu religion. And they also were not under direct uh, Mughal control. And ironically, those were the people who converted uh, in mass the most rapidly to Islam, um, where the Rajputs and Marathas didn't uh, convert that much. And under his reign, the Mughal Empire contributed to the world's GDP by nearly 25%, surpassing Qing China. So the Qing dynasty was surpassed and it was the world's largest economy and biggest manufacturing power, more than the entirety of Western Europe. And so really the Ottoman, Sulfavid, and Mughal dynasties um, made up the majority of the world's economy. So they not, weren't just the biggest imperial powers in the world during the medieval period, but they also controlled the world economy. And the Europeans knew that they weren't going to dominate the Islamic world through military force. And that's why they basically did economic sabotage in order to bring about the fall of these empires. Now, we did talk about the Sulfavids and uh, Qizilbash already, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about them. The Sulfavids, also known as the Sulfawiya, um, they were kind of the precursor to modern Iran. Um, they, you know, all of these empires were in the firearms age or the gunpowder age. And the interesting thing is about you know having rifles and guns is even though they were muzzle loaders and even though they didn't shoot very good they shot these round you know pellets this was before modern rifling so they basically were shooting kind of blunderbuss rifles um, but these primitive rifles allowed them to stave off uh, nomadic invasions so all throughout Islamic history so far we've been talking about you know the Ghaznavids the Seljuks the Mongols and all these different kind of waves of nomadic Turkic 
um, invasion, and then you have different types of uh, Mamluk, you know, slave soldiers brought into you know the Islamic empires all over the place. Um, these types of invasions stop in the gunpowder age because rifles are able to just take out nomads. They're not even with um, you know the what do you call them um, compound bow, bows that the Mongols had. None of that's able to stand up to a rifle, a uh, big you know group of riflemen. And so. Borders kind of start to stabilize between the Safavids and the Ottomans and Mughals. Between those three uh, empires, the borders are kind of locked. Even though they did have skirmishes and fights between one another, the borders didn't move much. And that had a lot to do with it being the gunpowder age. So, you know... Fast forward to World War One in Europe, and you have this sort of trench warfare where borders don't move much. You can also think of the Civil War in America being particularly bloody because it was quite hard to, you know, move the front line when you move into the rifle age, right? And this was the case with the Slavovids, Ottomans, and Mughals. What made the Slavovids kind of interesting or unique or perhaps evil in Sunni eyes was the fact that they forced a Sunni populace to convert to Islam. It was conversion by the sword. People were in fact beheaded for not uh, converting to Islam. And so it was quite a serious thing. Um, this took place mostly in the central lands of the Safavid Empire. And even to this day, on the peripheries of Iran, um, you do find uh, Sunni populations. So basically where the Ottoman, or excuse me, where the Safavid um, political kind of control couldn't, when you were far away on the peripheries, the, the government couldn't really get to you that well. They didn't have as much influence or as much power or as much enforcement on the day-to-day -day lives of people. And so those people remained Sunni. But the people who were closer to the central areas of power were forced to convert to Shi'i Islam. Um, and behind this was a Sufi order. So these were Sufi, Shi'as, the Qizilbash, um, Turkic uh, warrior Sufis, if you will, um, were kind of, you know, the main impetus behind um, Shah Ismail's power. And um, he is a sheikh of the Safawiya Sufi Brotherhood. And... He's crowned as Shah or King in 1501, and he announces Twelver Shi'ism or Imami Shi'ism as the state religion, and you know defeats this guy Shaybani Khan or the Shaybanids, and you know has skirmishes with the Ottomans, but essentially takes over the Persianate world. And then you have Shah Tahamasp, or Tahamasp, who was the son of Ismail, around 1524 to 1576, and he was known as a great, a great patron of the arts. And then you have Shah Abbas, Shah Abbas II, Shah Soleiman, and you know. Uh, that's not all of them, but I guess you would say the notables. And the Safavids, um, they ruled from 1501 to 1722. Um, and you had the Qajars after that, and it kind of like slowly moved into the modern Iranian state where you have the Pahlavi Shah, and then 
as we know the islamic revolution 1978 or 79 and the rest is history as they say with the hostage crisis and all of that um so the safavids are kind of the precursor to all of that they kind of set the tone for what will become modern iran and like i said they did rule all the way up till the 1700s you know 1776 is when america got its independence right and so the american colonies are already a thing um you know in the 1500s so imagine this is around the same time and in fact if you look at the lower picture you will see a figure on the left hand side in like a yellowish costume who looks like a pilgrim and in fact that was um, a European visitor to Shah Ismail the first and uh, the picture on top is where you see his uh, Qizilbash uh, followers with the the red turbans as they're famously known for right and Shah Ismail is wearing white with also a red um, turban, right? And so this is kind of gives you an idea as to what the early Safavid um, court looked like. And the fact that it was internationally recognized. People from Europe did go and visit these places. And this is, this is during the age of exploration for Europe. And um, so... In the early age of exploration, Europeans are trying to make contacts all across the world, initially for business purposes, for diplomatic purposes, as well as uh, trying to send missionaries to these countries, especially the Portuguese. And uh, this individual here looks uh, Dutch, and I'm assuming that's probably a, some sort of Dutch um, merchant or ambassador something of that nature to the Shah Ismail's court. Um, looks very much like the American pilgrims who did live in Amsterdam before uh, coming to America in the Mayflower. So that type of costume is very Dutch and that's why I am thinking that. And you also see it looks like women in European dress possibly or maybe that's Turkish uh, dress. And so the Safavids, um, you know, controlled Persianate uh, territory, if you will, and that's, you know, including, of course, Iran, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Armenia, parts of Georgia, parts of the Caucasus, Iraq, Kuwait, Afghanistan, parts of Turkey, Syria, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. So it's a large swath of territory. And Shah Tam Asp, he reigned from 1524 to 76. And he started a series of invasions into the Caucasus region. They were very interested in getting uh, Circassian and Georgian slaves. And, you know, they built up their own military slave system like the Mamluks had or like the Janissaries in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so still this uh, continuation of slave soldiers is going on. And what this did was it brought uh, Circassian uh, blood or Caucasian blood um, into Iran. And so it changed um, the way people look. It changed their phenotype. It added, uh, you know, all of a sudden there's people with blue eyes and blonde hair in the society. So, you know, it, it changed things. And these people have their, you know, the Circassians are very proud of their culture. They have a very proud um, culture. You, can, if, you know, if you know Arabic, you can type in Sharakisa and that's Circassians. Or sh or shut us into YouTube and there's all kinds of videos on them because they later migrated in waves um, into the Ottoman Empire as well uh, escaping Russian persecution as the Russians expanded into the Caucasus Mountains um, during the time of the Tsar
And so essentially, um, Shah Tam Asp, you know, conquered a lot of uh, new territory um, for the Safavid Empire and transplanting 30,000 people into the central Iranian heartlands. And um, these type of Janissary soldiers that were known as, you know, Rolaman i Khosa i Sharifa, these kind of royal uh, soldiers, if you will, they're like, this is kind of like the special forces, right? Uh, Rolaman comes from uh, Arabic Rilman, which is plural for male slaves. And then Khosa, um, meaning specific, and then Sharifa, meaning honored. So it's like these specific honored male slaves, or in other words, you could say special forces. These were the top of the top in the military echelon. Um, you know, much like the Mamluks or Janissaries. And, you know, the idea is that these people, like, they would be completely loyal to the state, not loyal to their ethnicity or their clan or tribe. And they're educated in Islam, in this case, Shi'i, Twelver Islam. So they know how to do all the acts of worship. And they are fervent, you know, Shi'i practicing Muslims. And a lot of these uh, Georgian and Circassian women became uh, wives and concubines of the Shah and integrated into the Safavid harem and um, some of them became quite powerful in the harem and in Safavid politics um, and they bore you know potentially the Shah children and he died in 1576 with a calm Safavid Empire with secure borders and no uh, imminent threat from the Uzbeks or Ottomans. But uh, people saw the central authority as being weak. The people on the peripheries weren't even converting to Shiism, as I mentioned. And I'll have a documentary in the module that you can watch about Sunnis in Iran. And so they have even Islamic universities in Iran, Sunni Islamic universities, big giant madrasas, and they get to write and publish books freely, big multi-volume tafsirs. And so that is kind of Safavid culture, imperial culture or courtly culture in a nutshell. Now we get to the Ottomans, right? And the Ottomans are special for many, many reasons. And the Ottomans are mythologized by Sunnis for many, many reasons. And I'm not going to give you kind of the complete overview of Ottoman history as you might expect. Because um, that's rather boring and rather bland. And so I'm going to focus on the parts that I find interesting that I also think you as my students will find interesting. And I know that there's all, you know, you have that historical fiction TV show Ertugul, that is out that is influential, even though it's full of all kinds of terribly horrible um, historical inaccuracies. It's beyond historical fiction. It's really just fiction. I'm sorry to say. Um, Ibn Arabi never met um, Ertugul or anything like that. That's just complete nonsense. Um, Ibn Arabi had absolutely nothing to do with the Ottomans. And what is true is that his son became Osman Ghazi. They say that Osman was probably a name he took later, and it comes from the Arabic word Uthman. So he's naming himself after the second caliph, Uthman, but he had a Turkish name before that. Um, so this is something he changed ostensibly in adulthood 
to show that he is Islamicized, where his dad, Ertugul, you know, had a, a Turkic name, right? And he reigned from approximately 1280 to, again, approximately 1299. Um, there's no primary historical sources uh, during his lifetime that talk about him. So when he was alive, he was rather considered a very obscure figure. And he um, did not even control all of Anatolia during that time. Um, in a sense, uh, he's kind of like Temujin or Genghis Khan. But Genghis Khan did get to see his empire, you know, expand rapidly during his lifetime, whereas Osman Ghazi did not. Um, you know, his history wasn't recorded until much later after his death, more than 100 years after his death, in fact. And so, you know, historians kind of wonder how much of this is mythological that's described about him and how much is fact. And so, you know, they all argue and debate about how to piece together his biography. And that's just a part of doing history is you, you have to kind of sift through the data and figure out what you think is important and what you think is true and not true. And historian Colin Ember, who's, he's a great Ottomanist, um, but an Orientalist, um, he's gone, you know, as far to say that it's impossible to describe, you know, Osman's life. That it's it's like a historical black hole. There's just really nothing there. Um, but in gen talking about the Ottomans more in general, uh, most sources would say that or agree that, you know, they belong to the uh, like a sub uh, tribe or a clan of the Oghuz Turks called the Kayit, and they fled their native homeland in Central Asia. You know, they're fleeing the Mongol expansion. Um, we also have to remember that, you know, the Mongols and the Turkics are from the Altaic Mountains originally. And so when the Turks, the Oghuz Turks, moved into Central Asia, they themselves were displacing Indic peoples because all of Central Asia was uh, Indic type people who spoke maybe something like proto ironic, you know, something related to Persian, but like an early form of it. And they were displaced by the Turks. And so the Turks have always had a very close um, contact, cultural contact, and influence by. Persianate peoples and typically were always bilingual or enough enough Turks in a tribe were bilingual and with Persian that they were always in communication and, and influence with one another trading with one another always in contact and so even the Ottomans themselves were a very Persianate um, empire Maybe the least of the Mughals and, and, you know, less than the Mughals, less than the Safavids, but still very much a Persianate, um, very much Persianate influenced. And so even Jalaluddin Rumi, who composed all of his stuff, you know, in Persian, was in the Ottoman Empire, you know, writing or composing all his stuff in Persian. Um, so got to keep that in mind that a lot of people... They might have spoken and written Ottoman Turkish as well as Persian, as well as Arabic. And so these were very cosmopolitan times. I mean, throughout Islamic history, we've seen quite a bit of cosmopolitanism, whether it's the Kipchak Turks um, or Circassian um, people who become, you know, Mamluks, where they have their own native language, native culture, but they're also fully acculturated into Islamic culture. They probably could speak some Arabic, if not completely fluent in it. Um, and my guess is they were fluent in Arabic as they were taught in madrasas. Um, so they were likely taught Arabic, but you know, being that they weren't native speakers, might have fumbled with it a little bit here and there as I do myself. Um, and so the Ottomans, in the early period, though, they would have been really just 
Turkic speakers with maybe some who spoke Persian here and there. I don't think Osman would have known any Arabic, although that's possible. And um, this was during the time of the Beyliks. They were kind of like um, principalities, if you will, in Anatolia. And Osman Ghazi was one of them and controlled, a, you know, part of Anatolia, a swath of it, but not all of it. And they started to displace the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. And Rum, in this case, means Anatolia. And this, there was Selajuka or Seljuk kind of uh, rulers who ruled over city states in Anatolia. They're kind of remnants of a bygone era. You know, the Seljuks had been displaced by the Ayyubids, you know, by the Mongols, by the Mamluks. I mean, they were they were really just a vestige of the past. There's no reason for them to be there, but they were there because Anatolia was kind of, especially the more the northern parts of Anatolia, central Anatolia, was rather untouched by the Mongols. The Mongols only got to like the southern parts of Anatolia, like Haran which is where Ibn Taymiyyah left as a child to go to Damascus. And so this, these kind of areas where you had these Seljuk uh, sultans, rulers, um, they were Turkic and they could still, according to some reports, speak Turkish. And so when the these Kayi Ogos Turks showed up at their doorstep, they spoke mutually intelligible languages, which is quite fascinating that the Seljuks could preserve their Turkish language even this far out when they had been ruling over that area, you know, since the, the 12th century, basically. Um, maybe, you know, this is maybe three or four generations of rulers, if not more. Um, and so when these Oghuz Turks come in, it's kind of like we speak the same language, we have a fairly similar culture, but, you know, no ruler of a principality in Anatolia is expecting all these refugees just to pop up on their land. However, they kind of tried to make an alliance with them at first, you know, ally with them against the you know Europeans against the real you know Byzantine Romans um, but essentially the Oghuz just take over and this one Seljuk Sultan and you see this portrayed in the TV show Ertugul but he basically appoints Ertugul as uh, the representative or like Emir for the Kai as a Muqaddam, like a says here lieutenant, but Muqaddam is, you know, it means like the person kind of preceding the rest of his people. He's kind of like in the front, so he's some kind of a leader, right? And the Seljuk Sultan, Kaya Qubad, you know, gave them some type of lands to settle on near Ankara, Turkey. Um, but eventually they took over from the Seljuks, right? And they think that Osman was born somewhere around 1258. Um, you know, and but that could be mythological because it's it's coinciding to the exact um, date that the Mongols invaded Baghdad, as as we talked about last week. Um, so, you know, it sounds a little suspicious, but if that's what's reported in the sources, then that's what's reported in the sources. Um, Allahu A'lam, right? And um, it's said that he was born in the town of Su'ut, and Su'ut is also where you find Ertugul's tomb, Erturbe in Turkish, which... Turba in Arabic kind of means like a piece of clay. 
or a piece of stone. So that's what they call tomb, because apparently they were made out of stone for the Turks. And, um, you know, that was the capital, basically, of the early Ottoman Empire. That would go on to change later. Now, Kamal Pasha Zadeh was a very big um, Hanafi Ottoman scholar. He was also a historian. And he mentioned that uh, Osman was Ertuğrul's youngest son. And he was raised in the traditional nomadic Turkic ways, learned wrestling, swordsmanship, horse riding, arrow shooting, falconry, all that kind of stuff he grew up with. And he outperformed all of his brothers. And you know, usually the youngest kind of has this some sort of special treatment by the parents. So maybe he benefited from that or took advantage of it. Um, and he was very influenced by Sufism, especially this particular Sheikh, Sheikh Edabali who lived from 1206 to 1326, so he lived a long time. <laughs> and um, he was an Ottoman Sunni Muslim sheikh from the Ahi Sufi Brotherhood, which is no longer really a popular Sufi Brotherhood. But he was the first judge or Qadi in the Ottoman Empire, so he had a significant position there. And the Ottomans always favored the Hanafi Madhab. That's because many Turks themselves were Hanafi before even they came to the Anatolian Peninsula. And Hanafism was the madhab of the Mughals and the official madhab of the Abbasids. So in a sense, if you're trying to make yourself look like a caliphate or a legitimate Islamic empire, Hanafism was, was, was the way to go. And as I mentioned before, this was the age of the Beyliks. Bey is kind of like a word for leader or prince. And so you had all these principalities, you know, Qara Kuyunlu, you know, Ay Kunyunlu, you know, Retna, Burhanuddin, Chandar, you know, Karaman, you know, all these types of places. Um, that were principalities. And so, where it says Seljuks of Asia Minor, just ignore that and look at the green words. And those were all the different principalities of um, Ogos Turks or Beyliks that developed in the 14th century. So the Ottoman Empire wasn't, it wasn't really the Ottoman Empire back then because it wasn't really completely unified it wasn't uh, spreading beyond Anatolia. It was kind of like this group of different uh, principalities, maybe like a loose coalition on the fact that they were all Ogos Turks. But eventually, you know, the Ottoman Empire would expand to uh, nearly reach Vienna, Austria, but uh, Parts of Poland, parts of Hungary um, were included in the Ottoman Empire. And even to this day now, if you go to Poland, there are mosques and Muslim communities that date back to the Ottoman period. Same thing in Hungary. They have mosques that were built during the Ottoman period still to this day and Muslims there still to this day who have a genealogy back to the Ottomans as well as in all these Eastern European countries that were part of the excuse me part of the Ottoman Empire during that time so in Greece you find Ottoman era mosques and Ottoman era you know communities that trace their way back Sufi brotherhoods that trace their way back to the Ottomans and eventually in Eastern Europe, um, there would be uh, revolutions and rebellions against the Ottoman Empire where the Greeks would gain their independence and so on and so forth. But it's also interesting to know that, you know, the Ottomans controlled a good chunk of North Africa, at least the coast of North Africa, 
Um, Islamic Spain was still a thing too. So the Muslims essentially surrounded uh, the Mediterranean Empire. You know, at one point, southern Italy was ruled over by Muslims as well as uh, Sicily and Cyprus. And so the Mediterranean was becoming uh, part of the Islamic uh, world, part of Islamic civilization. And in a sense, they were replacing the old Roman system. Remember, the Romans ruled all the way around the Mediterranean. And so European dominance of the Mediterranean was something they always took for granted. And the Ottomans were able to basically, along with you know, the various rulers in Islamic Spain and Morocco and things, they they nearly had Europe completely surrounded or taken over. At least Southern Europe was almost nearly completely taken over. And this was really scary for Western Europe, who became kind of, you know, this dominant force later on. They really saw the... the Islamic civilization as a very serious threat during the Ottoman period. And that's why they come back down so hard on the Ottomans later on, um, which is something we'll talk about uh, more next week. And, um, you know, it's important to also kind of look at lineage because lineage is so important to these pre-modern cultures. And so if we look at the lineage of Osman, there's four different lineages given by different historians. So um, but they all say that he's the son of Ertuğrul. And who was the grandfather? Was it Suleiman Shah or Gunduz Alp? I think that Enveri's lineage might be more likely because remember, Osman wasn't his original name. He had a Turkic name before that. And so it makes sense that his grandfather would also have a Turkic name. Why would that would be very strange to s kind of skip a generation? Why is why is the grandfather Suleiman? But then it goes to Kaya, which is a Turkish name. Kizil. You know, it, it doesn't it does it makes sense that all of his predecessors would have had um, Turkic names. But then again, Suleiman isn't just Islamic. Turkish people had, or I mean, uh, Jewish people had that name. Christian people had that name. And there were uh, Jewish and Christian Turks before they converted to Islam. So it's really hard to say which lineage is the true lineage. I think maybe more research would have to be done. And then Osman, you go to Orhan, Murad the first, you know, Bayezid the first, Mehmet, first, Murad the second, Fetah Mehmet, who's the, I believe he's the one that conquered uh, Constantinople, and then you have Bayezid the second, Yavuz the first, Yavuz Selim the first, or Selim, and Suleiman, Kanuni Suleiman. So, you know, you see the lineage uh, keeps going like that, and it's important to pay attention to. And then we have the Janissaries, or the Yenichiri. And they were slaves captured in warfare. And then they also had this child levy system, or Devshirme system. And um, they were paid regular salaries by the Sultan. So even though they were technically slaves, they're paid rather opulently. They have nice clothes. They're extremely educated. Here again, they're like special forces, like Green Berets and the Marines. Um, it says that, you know, infantrymen, infantrymen, sure, but the elite special forces, the top of the top of the military. Um, and they often served as administrators. Many of them, like I said, were highly educated, could read and write, spoke multiple languages. And so they, they did administrative tasks as well, or more strategic, you know, planning within the military, logistics in the military. Not all of them were uh, just always on quote unquote fighting soldier type duties. Um, there's more to that even in modern militaries. 
and um, there's references to them as early as 1395 and some ulama you know thought that this wasn't allowed in Sharia others thought it was so it was kind of a little controversial but it was something that continued nonetheless and um, like I said there's a very old practice um, that goes back you know way before the Ottomans even and basically there was a tax on conquered territories where they would have to provide male children from ages 8 to 20 um, they were basically conscripts they were drafted into the military um, every five to ten years um, it's portrayed oftentimes in Dracula movies talking about Vlad the Impaler um, said that even he had to give up one of his sons or something like that to the Ottomans um, so this was something that even in cultural memory now in Eastern Europe is not looked favorably upon um, but this was a practice that did take place they would be brought to Istanbul converted to Islam and trained for you know different career paths some more some more for it as administrators some more as uh, you know fighters and soldiers but they were all considered kind of the elite military class and all of them could fight even if they were you know working in administration they were still cream of the crop top soldiers and um, they would become you know infantrymen like janissaries or palace officials or scribes or even become ulama um, but they all could fight they were all trained in military arts um, even the ones who went and become ulama um, they were soldier ulama warrior ulama right military ulama they were a bit different and they were thoroughly integrated into the Ottoman bureaucracy right that Kafka-esque bureaucracy that we mentioned and it just decreased in the 16th century and started becoming more infrequently used and the practice was ended under Ahmed the the third sorry in 1705 um, but they did have this kind of uh, upwardly mobile career um, where you know they could they, they were like the elites not only in the military but in society at large very wealthy people very well connected very powerful so in a sense yeah they were taken away as slaves but they had a lot of money and power and would outgrow that and here's a manuscript kind of depiction or picture of you know janissary children um you know in in red um as they're kind of being taken by the ottomans from their homeland and as we know the ottomans are quite famous for the conquest of constantinople on the bottom there you can see just how large their cannons were that's a real uh, cannon from the conquest of Constantinople and you know the, the only reason Constantinople was able to be conquered was because it was the gunpowder age and with these large cannons that they could pummel the walls of Constantinople with that allowed them to eventually conquer the city where as no Muslim was able to conquer it before then and so the attacking Ottoman army um, vastly outnumbered Constantinople's defenders and um, was commanded by Mehmet II nicknamed Al Fatih the Conqueror and they conquered the city in 1453 it became the new Ottoman capital replacing Adrianople and this led to the fall of the Byzantine Empire which was a continuation of the Roman Empire you know which began in roughly 27 BC and lasted all the way up until 1453 so you had nearly 1500 years of 
Byzantine or Roman control over Constantinople, the loss of Constantinople is so uh, strongly felt all across Europe. And to this day, it's highly lamented in Greek culture. Uh, they still constantly talk about it and, and mourn it. And I had a Greek friend I was talking to who said, whenever I would find out somebody was Turkish, I would immediately tense up. My body would become uncomfortable and tense. And I, the only thing I could think is these people are the enemy. They stole our greatest city. And this was a Greek American, someone who was born and raised in America. Um, so this is still kind of a sentiment that's deeply ingrained and um, was deeply traumatic for Europe. And it continued as the Ottomans expanded, almost reaching Vienna. They sieged Vienna, you know. And so Europe was deeply traumatized by the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. That's just the reality. And a lot of modern Islamophobia has genealogies going back to this period and, and even further, frankly. And, you know, it's considered a turning point in military history because this is where cannons reign supreme and cannons can destroy castle walls. And cities that were thought unconquerable or impenetrable are suddenly conquerable. They're suddenly, their walls can be destroyed, right? Constantinople was thought to have the most advanced defensive system in the entire world at the time. And guess what? It was blown to bits by these cannons. So it made all of the feudal kings who ruled from castles a bit scared had them clutching their pearls and cannons be started to become ubiquitous after this time and they started to be outfitted on ships and all that type of stuff right and so we are entering the gunpowder age as i'm trying to to stress during this time it's not just rifles and pistols blumber bus type technology but it's these, these huge cannons I mean, just massive cannons and all of this i'm not going to get into too deeply because if you're really interested in it there's this netflix documentary called rise of empires ottoman that was made in 2020 if i remember right so there's the link for it and you can watch that if you want to know much more about um the conquest of constantinople and the ottoman empire it's kind of got these phases that it went through you know you have the rise of it the classical age transformation you have this old regime and then you get to this period of decline and modernization where the west is subverting ottomans safavids and moguls um economically russia and europe is taking territory away from the ottomans encroaching on the ottomans um greece and some of these eastern european states are vying for independence muhammad ali basha who you know rules underneath um the ottomans uh, controlling egypt is kind of a little out of control you have the napoleon you know invades egypt uh, and you know the readings um for the reading response get into that so i'm not going to cover it here those readings also get into Muhammad Ali Basha, so I'm not going to cover it here. Um, but this period of decline and modernization is extremely important to understand because you had, after the invasion of Egypt by Napoleon, you have all kinds of um, people being sent from Islamic lands over to Europe to study to gain knowledge, to get PhDs from their universities, to learn their military technology and get trained by the European militaries on how to have a modern military because they could clearly see that Napoleon could invade them and conquer Cairo. The Ottomans were losing territory in Eastern Europe. Russia was encroaching on 
Ottoman and Muslim lands. You had huge swaths of refugees from the Caucasus Mountains settling in the Ottoman Empire, like the Circassians and the uh, Chechnyans. A lot of them settled in what's now modern day Jordan, um, near Amman, in this area called Suwayla. And they lived in the caves there until they're able to build their own houses and get assimilated into the culture and everything. So this, this was a time where uh, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals felt threatened by Europe. So they sent all these people over there to study, learn their ways, learn the technology, learn their military, and bring all that back. And when they bring all that back, unfortunately, they bring a lot more than just that. They bring all kinds of foreign ways of thinking from the West. And what ends up happening is the Muslim world gets slowly intellectually colonized. And this is where you get all of a sudden the Westernization of the Muslim world. And that's what global capitalism was desiring is for the world to kind of um, change to this new economic model that was becoming hegemonic was becoming dominant all over the world. And this is the time uh, you know, um, of slavery in the United States. And slavery predominantly boomed with the cotton age. And we all know about cotton in the Southern states of America. I'm in Georgia, where that was a big part of the economy here at one point. And Egypt was a major producer of cotton, but Egypt could not sell its cotton cheap enough to be competitive on the market. Why? Because America was selling cheaper cotton because of its slave labor, and therefore the Ottoman Empire's economy kind of fell apart due to the slavery happening in America. So there was a lot of turmoil happening during this decline and modernization phase that caused quite a bit of issues and basically was ended up being the downfall for these three empires, not just the Ottomans, but the Safavids and Mughals as well. And in fact, India was invaded by the British as we know, and the Mughals and British actually were fighting each other. Um, so that is that. And so for the Ottoman Empire, we have these phases of reform, the Tanzimat and the Young Turks. And Tanzimat comes from the word Tanzima in Arabic, which is um, like a reorganization of the uh, Nidom, Nidom meaning regime. So it's like a reorganization of the political regime. That's what Tanzimat means. It's plural, so you're talking about uh, multiple reforms going on. Um, it started around 1839 and kept going until roughly the 1880s. Um, it's characterized by all these different attempts to modernize the Ottoman Empire in some way, shape, or form. Mostly they meant economically and militarily was the goal, at least, of the political elite. But it ended up becoming, you know, they brought back from Europe um, a way of dressing with the bow ties and the dress shirts and the slacks and modern dress shoes. Many of them were bilingual because they studied in France or England or Germany. So they're bringing back with them European culture essentially. And thinking, you know, they bring back an internalized racism where they think they, they need to kind of uh, take um, the Ottoman Empire uh, and Europeanize, Europeanize it take Islam kind of out of the picture in certain ways. And so they want to create sort of like a constitution. They look at the caliphate as being some type of monarchy that needs to go away. And it's also dangerous to kind of call the Ottoman Empire a caliphate because the Ottomans themselves didn't use the word caliph until like the early modern period. Um, they always use the term Sultan. So they didn't consider themselves a caliphate first. And, and so 
these reforms encouraged Ottomanism. Like you're a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, no matter what religion or ethnicity you were. Um, and dress, the way you dressed, you know, was changed, as I mentioned, with like the bow tie, the dress shirts, the slacks, these kind of long uh, suit coats, which you still see in Syria, like with Ramadan, Sheikh Ramadan and Bulti. He was famous for wearing that type of outfit. You'll see that with the ulama still. Um, you know, in Syria and in Turkey, they have these juba type things that they wear with dress shirts. Um, and you can see that here. And of course, they have the tarbush, you know, the, the Ottoman uh, fez along with all that. And then women started adop adopting Western dress and they stopped wearing hijab during this time. So that actually was before Ataturk. This was something that started happening in the 1800s where all over the Ottoman Empire, but especially in Turkey, a lot of women uh, stopped wearing hijab. And so that was, they thought that was part of modernizing the country, these uh, kind of Tanzima activists, if you will. And, um, you know, they had um, like series of constitutional reforms. They had, uh, parliament that was set up they decriminalized homosexuality even before this the ottoman empire never really enforced laws uh you know anti-gay laws or anything like that homosexuality was just largely kind of ignored um and there's lots of books on that if that's something you're interested in researching um and they further bureaucratized islamic law into what became known as the Ottoman Majella or Majella e Ahkami Adaliye. And um, they also had guilds for modern factories, like uh, unions, probably, is what we would call them nowadays. And then um, a lot of the, you know, this is how it always goes a lot of these reforms that got made, or quote unquote progress that got made, got reversed. And when that got reversed you had the young turk movement right and the young turks they were also a political reform movement um in the early 1900s that they wanted to you know bring the parliament back and bring a constitutional government back um they didn't really want a khilafah type system or anything that looked like that or anything that looked authoritarian and they led a rebellion against Sultan Abdul Hamid II in 1908, known as the Young Turk Revolution. Their slogan was a French slogan, Vive la Patrie, Vive la Nation, Vive la Liberté. So uh, long live the fatherland, long live the nation, long live liberty, right? And it's very similar to a lot of French slogans, you know. Um, so, you know, they wanted to establish like a second constitutional era and have a multi-party democracy. And they were inspired by this group called the, you know, Young Italy Political Movement or Young Italians. And because some of them actually went and studied in Italy, right? And so after World War One, they essentially split up into different political parties and kind of became the political parties that would function under Ataturk's uh, time. And so that is kind of more or less the um, Tanzimat and Young Turks in a nutshell. Um, the background picture that's like a watermark is a picture of the actual, you know, some of the actual Young Turks. And you could see they're wearing, you know, modern western dress suits with a bow tie and very nice modern western you know dress shoes slacks they all got just mustaches some of them might have full beards but some of them only mustaches which was pretty different than earlier times in ottoman period um so you know this postcard here um kind of sh it shows you the the culture their their aesthetic the way they presented themselves right in this postcard and it's bilingual it's an ottoman turkish 
and it's in French, which shows, you know, what this educated class looked like. It's dated to 1908, you know, when they had their revolution. So it's a very, very interesting uh, piece of material history there. And with that, I will end the video here. And there's a bunch of recommended videos in the module that I do strongly encourage you to check out if you have the time. If you'd rather watch that than something else mindless on the internet. Um, but with that, I'll bid you adieu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Did you know that the largest diamond in the Queen's crown jewels was stolen from a 10 year old Indian boy in the 19th century? Or that in 1700, India was worth a staggering $21 trillion by today's standards. The country was ruled by the Mughal Empire. Its economy was so large and so powerful that it was bigger than all of Western Europe's combined. 250 years later, India was one of the poorest countries in the world. So what went wrong? It all started with a single British ship docking in Surat in 1608. By the mid-20th century, an estimated $45 trillion had been stolen from India, and an estimated 35 million people had died in multiple famines. How did the men from an island 13 times smaller than India loot and plunder the country and get away with it? It wasn't the British government that seized India, but a small private company headquartered in a tiny office in London. The private company went on to become one of the most powerful corporations the world has ever known. It went on to conquer large parts of South Asia and commanded an army of a quarter million men. This is how the war began. By the 17th century, Spain and Portugal controlled a monopoly on goods from the East. But Britain wanted in so that they could trade in cotton, silk, spices and tea. Queen Elizabeth signed a royal charter allowing a group of Englishmen to sail to the East Indies on behalf of the Crown. And so the British East India Company was born. In 1613, the first British factory was set up in Surat. But the company wasn't your conventional business. They had a private army. By 1757, as the Mughal dynasty went into decline, the company waged war on the last Nawab of Bengal and his French allies. They seized control of the entire state of Bengal. The state was ravaged by war, then by famine. Robert Clive, a company man, became the governor of the state, draining its wealth. The entire Bengal treasury was loaded onto a hundred boats and sent down the Ganges and onward to the company's Calcutta headquarters. He collected taxes and customs from local Indians, which were then used to purchase Indian goods and export them to England. Wait, so this means that they took over the land, charged local people to live there, and then used the money to get rich. Yep, that's exactly it. Robert Clive returned to Britain as the richest self-made man in the country, but he ended up committing suicide by slitting his own throat in 1775. After Bengal, the company went on to seize other regions even Delhi, the Mughal capital of India, and everything south of it. What honour is left of us? asked a Mughal official named Narayan Singh shortly after 1765, when we have to take orders from a handful of traders who have not yet learned to wash their bottoms. The company's shareholders elected merchant statesmen who dictated policy for the people who lived there. At its height, the company generated almost half of Britain's trade at the expense of Indians. The company even stole the most priceless jewel in India, the Kohinoor diamond, from a 10-year-old boy. Until 1839, the 186 carat diamond belonged to Sikh Maharaj Ranjit Singh. When he died in his sleep, his stone and throne was left to his five-year-old son. For the next five years, the company destabilized his kingdom and even locked his mother, the Queen Regent, in a tower. The 10-year-old was forced to sign over his diamond and his land to the British. The jewel still belongs to the crown. But in 1857, a rebellion began to spread. It all started with Indian sepoys serving in the company's army and then grew. It lasted 18 months and Indians were brutally suppressed by the company. In 1858, the British government finally ended company rule in India. The end was brought upon by distrust in the company and the rebellion. But the move was made to entrench British rule, not withdraw it. The country was transferred from the company to the crown. The remaining vestiges of the Mughal dynasty were abolished and the Emperor Bahadur Shah was exiled to Burma. Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India. And so the British Raj began. The crown ruled over almost all of modern-day India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Some regions were still controlled by local princes who, under pressure, had to pledge their support for British rule. The Queen promised that Britain would work harder for their Indian subjects, but did they? To maintain colonial rule, they used a divide-and-conquer strategy. They pitted Indians against one another, making the Hindu caste system more rigid and deepening communal divides between Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs. In 1905, England even tried to divide Bengal into Hindu and Muslim sections, but it failed. 
And of course, there were different rules for the British and Indians because, you know, racism. Indians weren't allowed into the civil service for most of the time the British ruled. When they finally were, they were often accused of cheating and barred from gentlemen's clubs. The justice system was also discriminatory. A British man who shot his Indian servant could get six months in jail and a fine. An Indian man who raped a British woman could get 20 years behind bars. And then there were the famines. Between 1717 and 1947, an estimated 35 million Indians died in 11 massive famines. The British didn't believe in governmental intervention in Indian famines. The Bengal famine in 1943 was a direct result of failed policy. The British worsened a bad harvest year by restricting interstate trade and diverting supplies to soldiers. It got so bad, starving people threw themselves in front of trains and parents dumped their children into wells. Then there was the forced migration. The British moved an estimated 1.6 million Indians to North America, Africa and Pacific Islands as indentured labourers. They were forced to travel and work in squalid conditions. That's if they survived the journey. Britain also dragged India into World War I and deployed 1.5 million soldiers. 60,000 of them never returned home. In 1919, in response to a protest against unlawful arrests, British soldiers massacred unarmed Sikh men, women and children who had gathered to celebrate the Sikh New Year in Jallianwala Bagh. More Indian troops were deployed to fight for Britain in World War II, and the Princely States loyal to the Crown donated cash for the war effort. But surely Britain gave India some good stuff, like the railways and tea? The British built railways so that they could efficiently transport Indian goods to the ports and then out of the country. And British investors made a fortune investing in it, all at the expense of Indians. In fact, they charged nine times more for each mile of the railway than in the US. And investors on the railroad got a guaranteed return on investment. You might have also heard that the British introduced Indians to tea. But what you won't have heard is that the tea came at the cost of felling vast forests, stripping the indigenous people who lived there of their own land and exploiting poorly paid Indian labourers. In fact, tea was for export only because what little that there was left was too expensive for most Indians to buy until after the Great Depression. As Shashi Tharoor puts in his book Inglorious Empires, what had been one of the richest and most industrialised economies of the world, which together with China accounted for almost 75% of world industrial output in 1750, had been reduced by the depredations of imperial rule to one of the poorest, most backward, illiterate and diseased societies on earth by the time of independence in 1947. And let's talk about that independence. Britain decided they couldn't run India after World War II. Talks of the Brits leaving led to communal violence, communal violence which was fueled by Britain's divide and rule strategy. Britain wanted to get out of India and fast. Sir Radcliffe, a British lawyer who had never been to India before, was tasked with carving up the map into a country for Hindus and one for Muslims in 36 days. But no one told the Indians where those lines were until the actual day of independence. This led to mass panic and chaos which fueled suspicion and fear. While an estimated 15 million people were uprooted in one of the greatest migrations in history, between 1 and 2 million of them died because of large-scale communal violence, starvation and disease. At least 75,000 were raped or abducted. Muslims trekked to East and West Pakistan, while Hindus and Sikhs went the other way. Britain left with hardly a shot fired, but their near 400-year presence there had brought a vast and rich empire and people to ruin. T.E. Lawrence was dubbed Lawrence of Arabia by the press following his time fighting in the Middle East, but what the public knows about him from pop culture is only a small part of the story. This is the tragic, real-life story of Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence's beginnings were, according to his biographical profile, quite scandalous for Victorian Britain. His father, the Irish nobleman Thomas Chapman, left his wife and two daughters to elope with their Scottish governess, Sarah. The pair then adopted the name Lawrence and lived under it as husband and wife, eventually having five sons together. T.E. was born August 16, 1888 in Wales. Later, the family moved to Oxford. T.E.'s youngest brother, Arnold, once remarked that the Lawrence boy's tumultuous childhood was harder on T.E. than the war. Some of that trauma was the result of great expectations. Sarah Lawrence thought T.E. was destined for an extraordinary life. It wasn't enough that he be a high achiever, he had to be perfect. Eventually, T.E. moved out of the family home and into a cottage at the edge of the property. Lawrence thrived as a student, first in high school and later at Oxford, where he studied history and wrote his thesis on Crusader castles. 
when World War I broke out, Lawrence was on an archaeological dig in Syria. The British Army assigned him to the map-making department in Cairo, where, again, Lawrence distinguished himself. A desk job wasn't enough for the driven Lawrence. He was anxious to do more, especially after his brothers, Will and Frank, were killed in action on the Western Front. According to this survey of Lawrence's life, losing Will and Frank was one of his main motivations for joining the Arab Revolt against Turkish forces in 1919. He felt horribly guilty that his brothers had sacrificed their lives for the cause of freedom and wanted to be part of history rather than just a witness to it. I deem him one of the greatest beings alive in our time. We shall never see his like again. In 1916, Arabs living in the Hejaz region of what is now Saudi Arabia launched a revolt against the oppressive practices of the Ottoman Empire. Because the Ottoman Empire had aligned itself with Germany, the British took the side of the Arabs, sending T.E. Lawrence to the conflict zone to act as a liaison officer to Prince Faisal, the son of Sharif Hussein of Mecca. According to this review of a recent biography in the Christian Science Monitor, Lawrence, having eschewed Western dress for flowing robes and the kafia headpiece, led a motley band of fighters to an unlikely victory, relying primarily on a set of guerrilla tactics Lawrence invented himself. His battlefield heroics caught the attention of the American journalist Lowell Thomas, who, as this PBS piece details, saw in Lawrence a dashing matinee idol sure to capture the public's imagination. Thomas filmed Lawrence on location in Faisal's camp and turned that footage into a reel he debuted in New York and London. Lawrence later accused Thomas, whom he described as vulgar, of exploiting his image. Lawrence's fame only grew when he published his memoir, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, in 1926. The press and the public hounded him. He became, at 30, a reluctant celebrity. Having spent his youth courting adventure and attention, he now entered the Royal Air Force in the Tank Corps as an enlisted man under a series of assumed names. On one hand, hundreds if not thousands of Arab soldiers and compatriots considered T.E. Lawrence an inspiration and a hero. The same can be said for school kids growing up in 1920s and 1930s Britain and America. Lawrence was undoubtedly brave and dashing and brilliant, having received absolutely no combat training before he joined up with Prince Faisal in his fight against the Turks, Lawrence showed himself to be a cunning and often ruthless military strategist. On the other hand, Lawrence was a product of his time. He embraced the Arab culture, but according to Commonweal magazine, he could be cruel in his attitude toward Arabs he considered beneath him. He was, in some ways, a classic colonialist, dismissing 20th century Arabs as illogical and city Arabs as not worth knowing. He wrote in his memoir, The perfectly hopeless vulgarity of the half-Europeanized Arab is appalling. Better a thousand times the Arab untouched. In addition, many of the guerrilla warfare tactics that he invented for use against the much more powerful Turks, including improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, and the strategic and systematic destruction of lines of communication are still used today, particularly in Middle Eastern conflicts. Meaning that Lawrence might have been successful in helping Arabs fight the Turks, but he also undeniably has modern blood on his hands. In January 1917, Lawrence, by then embedded with Bedouins, had one of his best days as a leader of the so-called Arab Revolt, and one of his worst. The month began with a successful raid on Turkish soldiers in which, according to this examination of his life and legacy, Lawrence and a group of 35 armed tribesmen were able to capture two Turks and bring them back to their camp for questioning. It ended, however, with Lawrence feeling like he had no choice but to execute a member of his own militia in order to forestall a blood feud. The killing haunted Lawrence the rest of his life. During this time, Lawrence was very ill, struggling with boils, dysentery, and malaria. He was also plagued with uncertainty about the mission. He worried constantly that, as he and his band of brothers swept across the desert toward the coastal city of Aqaba, blowing up railways and collecting Bedouin soldiers as they marched, that it was all for naught, that the Arabs were being played for fools, and he wrote in his personal journal that he wanted nothing more than to flee the fight or be killed. Neither happened, of course, and Lawrence remained in the fray until the bitter end. In his memoir, Lawrence writes lovingly of a man named Salim Ahmed, nicknamed Dahum, which in Arabic means the little dark one. According to PBS, Lawrence met Dahum while on an archaeological dig in Karkamish on what is now the Turkey-Syria border. Lawrence was impressed with the young man's intelligence and started giving him English and math lessons. In return, Dahum taught Lawrence Arabic. The two were inseparable for several years, going on expeditions together and fueling rumors that their relationship was not strictly platonic. 
In June 1914, Lawrence left Dahum behind in Carchemish in order to serve as a liaison between the British Army and the Arab rebels fighting Turkish forces. Four years later, while Lawrence prepared for the pivotal battle for Damascus, he heard that Dahum had died of typhus during a famine that wiped out thousands of lives in 1916 and 1917. When all the fighting was over and Lawrence was back in his native Britain, he dedicated the Seven Pillars to S.A., who most scholars believe was Salim Ahmed. And Lawrence prefaced the book with a poem in which he claims that his stint as a soldier was always motivated by his love for S.A., writing, I loved you so I drew these tides of men into my hands and wrote my will across the stars to earn you freedom. Almost from the beginning of the Arab revolt against the Turks, Lawrence had misgivings about how the conflict would end and what sort of life his Arab friends could count on once Britain and France became involved. Lawrence, who attended the Paris Peace Talks in 1919 and the Cairo Conference in 1921, both of which were convened at least in part to negotiate Arab independence, was deeply disappointed in the outcomes of such discussions. Rather than hammer out the details of a peace agreement with Arabs in good faith, British and French dignitaries simply divvied the Middle East up between them. This mockery of diplomacy became known as the sykes picot Agreement. Lawrence, still intent on furthering the Arab cause, went to work for Winston Churchill in 1920 to try to exert some influence, but it was all to no avail, and he ended up so disillusioned that, according to the Virginia Quarterly Review, he declared Arab unity, quote, a madman's notion. Around this time, a Scotsman confessed to the London Sunday Times that Lawrence hired him to administer periodic beatings. Whether this sadomasochistic behavior was guilt-based and tied somehow to Lawrence's powerlessness in the face of Imperial Britain and France, or if it was something else, is unknown and a matter of some speculation. T.E. Lawrence had all the qualities of a leading man on stage and screen. He seemed to live his life in search of the next great adventure. He went from unearthing treasures as an archaeologist to the battlefield where, alongside kings, princes, and tribesmen, he helped an oppressed people defeat their Turkish overlords. So far, so dreamy, and so very masculine, at least in the conventional Victorian understanding of the term. Cross my heart and hope to die, it's all perfectly true. What many casual fans might not know is Lawrence was almost certainly homosexual. Aside from his relationship with Salim Ahmed, he took no small pleasure in the company of two very closely bonded young Arab servants, of whose obvious attachment he makes this observation. They were an instance of the Eastern boy and boy affection, which the segregation of women made inevitable. Such friendships often led to manly loves of a depth and force beyond our flesh-steeped conceit. When innocent, they were hot and unashamed. Lawrence, it would appear, was not unashamed. He was successful in keeping his sexuality hidden from the public until his early death in 1935. Even now, whether he was gay or perhaps asexual is up for debate. Back from the battlefield and having gotten his fill of fame, T.E. Lawrence tried to retreat to private life and, in 1922, entered the Royal Air Force under the assumed name John Hume Ross. According to history, Lawrence only spent a few months as a pilot. The press outed him as Lawrence of Arabia, even going so far as to suggest he might be working as a spy in India, and he was kicked out of the service. Lawrence was not one to rest on his laurels. He soon entered the Royal Tank Corps, again under an assumed name. This time, he picked Thomas Edward Shaw, in homage to the Irish playwright and Lawrence's good friend, George Bernard Shaw. Lawrence was, again, discovered and expelled from the Tank Corps, too. His plan to become a recluse wasn't going so well. In 1925, he re-enlisted in the RAF. Ten years later, he retired, having finally, it seemed, achieved his goal of near obscurity. He was, at the time, living in a small Spartan cottage in Dorset. He had no time to enjoy his freedom, though. A few months after his retirement, he was killed in a high-speed motorcycle crash. T.E. Lawrence was an unabashed motorbike enthusiast. According to The Telegraph, he owned eight expensive and state-of-the-art Bro Superior motorcycles, top-of-the-line bikes. On the morning of May 13, 1935, Lawrence, known to try to race a plane on occasion, was speeding through his neighborhood of Dorset when he spotted two boys on bicycles. He swerved to avoid the boys, sideswiping one of them. The impact caused Lawrence to hurtle over his bike's handlebars, and six days later, he died of his injuries. The circumstances of the accident itself seemed rather cut and dry back in 1935, but a letter he wrote to the head of the Royal Air Force's publicity department, unearthed decades after his death, has some scholars wondering if the crash wasn't actually deliberate on Lawrence's part. 
In the letter, Lawrence wrote that facing retirement from the RAF, he wished he were dead. He also expressed dismay at the prospect of trying to find another job. He knew the press would follow him wherever he went and ruin his chances of success. He ended the letter by saying he did not want to grow old, ever. Tragic irony of ironies, Lawrence got his wish, and the world was robbed of one of its most legendary and intriguing figures. Of course, nothing feeds legend and intrigue like an early death. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call or chat online with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255.